Sometimes we pray at a situation. Intercession stands in the shoes of and prays on behalf of as though it was our own issue. You pray for your neighbor. It's not just praying at them, but we pray as though their struggles are ours. And this is incredible. Jesus and the Holy Spirit both put on our shoes and pray for us as though our issues were theirs. A man and his wife and his mother-in-law went on vacation to the Holy Land. While they were there, the mother-in-law passed away. The undertaker told them, you can have her shipped home for $5,000, or you can bury her here in the Holy Land for $150. The man thought about it, told him he'd just have her shipped home. The undertaker asked, why would you spend $5,000 to ship your mother-in-law home when it would be wonderful to have her buried here and spend only $150. The man replied, a man died here 2,000 years ago. He was buried here. Three days later, he rose from the dead. I just can't take that chance. <laughs> I want us to pray for uh, we just prayed for impossible financial situations I'd like for us to pray for another one uh, before we get into the, the word um, anyone who's facing what seems to be an impossible medical health situation I'd like for you to stand if you would you already did that? you did that too? No, no, you, you, you covered it. All right, I wasn't here. I was at the other campus. We, we, we get translated. Actually, it's a car that drives us slowly, safely. All right, let me try one more, see if you covered this one. I mean, yeah, you, you've already covered everything I wanted to do. Did you cover my message too? Do we just go home now or, yeah? <laughs> you opened, yeah, you opened with, yeah, that's awesome. All right, good night. <laughs> no, 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 if you, if you covered it, that's it. Would you say amen to it? Uh, but the last thing I wanted to pray for corporately, if it hasn't already been taken care of today, <laughs> those who are facing any kind of uh, family and or relational impossibility, seems impossible, I want you to stand. We're going to pray for you. Uh, those who are watching uh, by Bethel TV, we bless you and ask you to join your faith with us as well for your own breakthroughs and for the breakthroughs represented in this room. All right. Well, you guys know what to do. You got people standing around you that need you to join your faith with theirs and pray for that relational miracle. Uh, for some, it's uh, uh, family members who have turned from the Lord. They need to be restored. For others, they've never come to faith. For others, it's just uh, this confusion, this dividing wall that's come against people, whatever the case might be, just pray for these folks. Pray for them out loud right now. Pray for that spirit of breakthrough to come upon them right now, that God would restore families, family members, relational issues, that there would be healing there in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, we just pray for the same for those who are watching at home uh, over Bethel TV. We just pray that the spirit of reconciliation would come upon your household, that there'd be great healing, there'd be great restoration. The God who restores everything would restore every single household uh, represented here. We declare that the God of all peace would establish in peace over family lines. We pray in Jesus' name. Jesus name. All right, you guys did good. Bless them good. Hug them or give them a high five or something. Beautiful. All right, you did well. You did well. Open, if you would, open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> Romans 
Romans chapter 8. Before uh, we, we uh, open this, um, I want to give you just a, a, a brief word and report. Eric and Candace are uh, in Austin. They send their love. Eric texted me this morning to make sure I, I gave you his love. And um, they uh, helped to open uh, Bethel Austin, the Austin, Texas Bethel. And I, I just guess it went so well. They had a, a thousand seats that were spoken for a long time ago, so that's a good way for a church to start with a thousand people. So that's pretty amazing. So um, that uh, that is up and running, and uh, I guess they just did really good. I had great reports. Lauren Valton is there <clears throat> to help with the grand opening, and she sent me a text. She said, Eric and Candace did so amazing. Candace just dropped the Holy Ghost bomb on the place and <laughs> stepped in her element. It was just so beautiful. So just let you know that um, the, family, the family outside of here is doing well. And uh, it's very, very fun uh, to hear the constant reports. Um, you know, we, uh, for those of you who may not know, we've never taken it on as a primary goal to create other Bethels around the world. Our joy is actually serving the existing church. But occasionally, uh, it becomes very obvious that we're to plant one. And so we do that. But it's the exception, not the rule. But, but, uh, but we also take great pleasure in the Bethel, Atlanta, and Austin, and Ohio, Cleveland. Wherever else they are, they're there. Bless them, Jesus. Amen. All right. And then we have another uh, spiritual son. I was just up in uh, Portland this week. Yeah. I head to Indonesia tomorrow, but uh, <clears throat> Portland uh, this week with with uh, Chris O, Chris Hover Street, and uh, it was, it's just amazing. They got this auditorium that seats 9,500 people, I think it is, <clears throat> and they had 7,000 uh, seats sold, and they were leaving 2,500 for people to come in from the community to receive Christ. And uh, I, I spoke uh, Friday morning. I got there Thursday afternoon uh, uh, with uh, TV interviews and s s stuff of that nature. And then that night, Todd White spoke, and Jake Hamilton led worship. So that's nitro and glycerin. <laughs> or, uh, or, it, was, it was so fun. At the end of the evening, Todd gives this altar call, and they literally ran. To, he wouldn't let him walk. He told them, run, run. They ran down to the front to to meet Jesus, and oh, goodness gracious. So, so, I'm, ooh, I'm still buzzing a little bit from that. If I talk about it, it kind of gets reactive. It was very, very powerful, very fun. And uh, to be in a room with, with uh, our spiritual sons and daughters, um, <clears throat> most of them half my age or less, uh, in this room, in a prayer room before the meeting starts, and to, to watch these, these guys just step up to the plate and deliver, just so amazing. Um, the people that uh, Chris O got for this event, my goodness, Marilyn Hickey was there, uh, Lisa Bevere was there, um, Todd White, I forget all who was there, um, Robbie Dawkins is my fan, she was there, and so many uh, wonderful, wonderful people there uh, speaking, and, and it was just, it was great. It was just great to see Chris O pull that off. And um, he's, he's had this heart. If, you, if you've been around Chris Overstreet, he may have a greater heart for people to know Jesus than anybody I've ever met. I mean, it's convicting to be with him. <clears throat> you feel like you're not doing anything if you've not led anyone to Jesus today. <clears throat> he doesn't make you feel that way. It's just he just bubbles up with his passion for souls. And, and um, he's talked to us for years. He's been on our team here for, goodness, I don't know, 16 years or something like that. And he's talked to us for years about we need to do crusades. We need to do stadium events. You know, we need, I want to get a tent and take it around the country. And I mean, he's just constantly talking to us about it. And so we finally just said, go. <laughs> go. And, he, and he's doing it. I mean, it's just, oh, it's just mind boggling. I wish, I wish there was some way to capture some of this, put it on film just to let you see. Because, because everybody in this room is a part of this family. In some way, you have an investment into this that is happening up in Portland. I was, I was floored by the hunger in the room. I did not expect it. I did not expect that level of hunger and passion. I was, I was, it was overwhelming. It's wonderful. So it is 
Jesus' time for the Pacific Northwest. So that was very, very important. I, I love, you know, the Portland and on up Seattle, that whole area. I love that part of the country. And I've been there many times and ministered, always enjoyed it. But this time, this was... Holy Ghost steroids were in use. It was, it was a little extra oomph, so. All right, Romans 8, are you there? Yes? Yep. Yep. All right, if you're not there, get there, because you're gonna wanna be there. Romans chapter eight. Um, Romans eight could probably be a book, a book of the Bible by itself. Maybe you could say that for every chapter, but some chapters are very dependent on what, on what precedes it, what follows. Romans 8 is just this, I don't know, it, it's just a complete package. Romans 4 is this, Paul unveils Abraham as the father of faith and how his faith and his hope set a standard for every believer that follows. He actually set the stage, he's set the high watermark that everybody inherits in Christ. It's beautiful. Chapter five is, is this incredible chapter on our justification that by faith in Christ, we actually appear before God as though we had never sinned. It's the most astonishing thing. Chapter six is where we, we find that we are actually buried with Christ. And the cool thing, if you can picture water baptism, it says if you're buried with Christ, then you're also raised with Christ. And so here's this whole legal basis for not even considering yourself a sinner. He, he actually says it. He actually says it in verse 11 or 13, I forget which, but he, he says, don't even consider. You have to consider yourself dead to sin. You have to think of yourself in this way, I am dead to that. It's not mind over matter, it's the reality of the cross. It's the reality of the crucifixion of Christ in which we were included when we put our faith in Christ. We were actually included in that act and experienced death to an old nature and nature of sin. Chapter seven is a mysterious chapter that has confused many people through the years because in chapter seven, Paul says, what I try to do, I don't do, and what I don't try to do, I do wrong, and he just gives this whole scene. He's describing his life before Christ. And many people have used that chapter as a definition of the Christian life, and it's just not consistent with everything else Paul wrote. So we have chapter six, you're dead in Christ, you're raised in Christ. Chapter seven is before we knew Jesus, even when we tried to do the right thing, it just didn't always work out right, etc. And then we come to chapter eight. Chapter eight to me is the crown jewel of these five chapters. It's the crown jewel because the highlight, the emphasis in, in this chapter is our relationship with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the central person, the central theme in this chapter. It's not Abraham, it's not the, it's not the crucifixion, it's, not, it's the Holy Spirit who has been given to us in, in, this, in this chapter. It's important for this reason. <clears throat> Everyone in this room that is born again, you are born again because he spoke, you listened and responded. None of us found God. He found us. Yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like running from God through this forest and you trip over a rock and you look up and he's looking at you and, and you say, I'm so glad I found you. That's basically how all of us got saved. We, we, we ended up with seeing that there was only one reasonable option and it was to give ourselves to him. And, and so anyway, all of us are alive because we heard him speak and we responded. The Holy Spirit is the central person in our life and every triumph, every victory, every enablement, every bit of grace, everything that we experience in this life in following Jesus is there and it's active because the Holy Spirit is in our life. The Holy Spirit is God on earth. Everything about our life either succeeds or fails because of a relationship with him. 
I'm not referring to an emotion, although emotions are included. I'm not talking, talking about feelings, although feelings are included. It is a relationship with a person. This Christian life is a relational journey. And it is a relationship with God on earth, who is the Holy Spirit, who perfectly represents Jesus, who completely and perfectly manifests the will of the Father. So when we start in, in this chapter, what we're going to do today is we're just going to read a bunch of verses. And, uh, and I'll just stop uh, and just talk about a verse or two and a concept. What I'm looking for is I have one basic target. Um, I, I've been fighting, for, no, last, this is the third service now. I've been fighting for a, an, an adequate illustration, and I've not yet come up with one. Um, maybe I will by next week when I won't need it, but, uh, <laughs> but right now. Yeah. Have, have you ever, you know, just going through life and somebody says, oh, what a beautiful song. You didn't even know a song was playing, but as soon as they mentioned that song, you could hear it. Right? I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't made up in your mind. You could actually hear it, but you weren't aware of it. You became, your awareness became heightened to that sound when somebody mentioned it. Maybe you're just going through life not thinking of anything, and somebody says, Wow, oh, do you smell that? And then you, you weren't smelling it before, but as soon as they mentioned it, you go, Yeah, meat. <laughs> or, or other things, but, but meat primarily, yeah. Barbecue, thank you, Jesus, all right. And, you, and somebody mentioned all of a sudden, yes, yes, I do smell that. You, you, become, you have a heightened awareness. What I'm looking for is for us to have a heightened awareness of the presence of God. I've had certain things happen to me through the years where I became unusually aware of, of him. And it's terrifying and wonderful all at the same time. And I don't want to live any other way. Heightened awareness. It's not Im imaginary. It's not, it's, it's not that. It's, oh. It's, it's like Jacob said in, uh, when he, had, he woke up from that dream, he said, God is here, and I didn't even know it. Sudden heightened awareness to a reality that existed before he was aware. The Holy Spirit lives in you. He's also called, paraclete, the one called alongside to help. So the whole point is, I, I would like today to just help with a heightened awareness of God on earth that I have actually received as a down payment of an inheritance. Now, I don't understand that. If there's ever a mind-boggling thought, it's the fact that God gave us himself as our inheritance, and the initial payment is the Holy Spirit himself, the down payment. He's called down payment in Ephesians, the down payment of our inheritance. Larry Randolph <laughs> made a comment years ago. He said, if God is as big as he says he is, he shouldn't be that hard to find. <laughs> with someone that large in my life should not be that hard to discern. And if he is, I must have my heart and mind anchored in things that are very inferior, that have deadened what he has created in me as a capacity to recognize him. All right. Amen, Bill, good point. All right. Uh, he, uh, Hebrews, he, Hebrews, Ephesians. Let's just go through the books of the Bible. Romans. <laughs> Romans chapter 8. I, was, I meant it the first time. Romans 8. Uh, we're just, I'm going to kind of bounce around the chapter, so we're not going to read the whole thing. I actually, this morning, as I was reading over this, I thought, oh my goodness. We easily could do three or four weeks of this chapter because it is so pregnant, but we'll just uh, skim over maybe uh, seven, eight, nine verses, something of that nature. All right, verse 1 of chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Verse 14. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Now go back to verse 1. 
There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who are in Christ walk according to the Spirit. That is the testimony of Scripture. Those who are in Christ, the evidence of my conversion is that I don't live according to carnal values, uh, fleshly, uh, carnal ex expressions and values, but instead by the Holy Spirit himself. My life with Christ is illustrated because of a partnership with God on earth, the Holy Spirit. It's illustrated, it is measurable. And he goes on to say that those who uh, are led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God. Um, I, the reason I want to hit on this for just a moment, we actually are going to spend more time later in the chapter, but the reason I wanted to hit on this for just a moment is some, there are certain subjects in, in, in the gospel that sometimes it feels to me like they have been elevated so high that they are, they are unreachable. And being led by the Spirit is one of those. And it is not. It's your nature to be led by the Spirit. Have, have, you ever, have you ever just thought of somebody you wanted to call or maybe swing by and visit? It wasn't no thundering voice from God. It's just, you know, you just, oh, I should call them. And you call them and you find out it was a, it was a, it was a miracle moment that God actually directed you. See, Jesus made a statement. He said, my sheep know my voice. What, what does he mean by that? There's a familiarity to the voice of God, to the life of a believer. So much so that there are times where I would have thought it was simply my desire, and I find out afterwards it was actually the voice of God. There's such similarity. Living immersed in Christ puts us in a place where we constantly are hearing that familiar voice. I, I don't mean overly familiar in a, in a wrong sense, but that familiar voice, it's not the thundering voice from the outside, it's that cry from the inside. And the beautiful part about this is the more we learn to yield ourselves to this work of the Holy Spirit, the more walking in the Spirit, so to speak, is normal and natural. It's, it's the normal reaction to a given situation. One of the conversations I've had with people of late has been, to re how, do you know, how do you know what to do in a given situation? Because sometimes there's a biblical principle that you, let's just say uh, there's a need. Sometimes there's a biblical principle of generosity and sometimes the biblical principle of, of helping them uh, to earn what, what they have. There's, there's biblical basis for both. How do you know what to do? You, 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 the only way you can know is, is recognize the mood of the Holy Spirit. It, it's his voice, it's his mood, it's his, how, how is compassion leading you? How, how is he directing you to express life? And it's this, it's this relational journey where it is our nature to illustrate faith. It is our nature to illustrate this life with Christ. Faith is another one of those exalted subjects where people just don't think they can live by faith when it's actually your nature to do so. Amen. It's our nature in Christ. So we move on to verse um, 20, let's see, 26. It says, likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness. We don't know. I mean, you know you got weakness. Anybody aware of those? Uh, yeah. But we probably wouldn't have listed the one he listed. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. So he considers it a weakness for us not to know what to pray for. Verse 27, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now, I don't know how you look at this. This is how I look at it. God, I want a million dollars. And then I pray in tongues. And the Holy Spirit says, man, don't give him a million dollars. <laughs> do, do not listen to that last request. Because we're trying to make him like Jesus, and that'll only mess things up. <laughs> he always prays exactly according to the heart and to the will of God. He knows exactly the tools, the elements, the issues that will take us to where we are all headed. 
We are all, we've all been predestined, according to Scripture, predestined to be conformed into the image of Jesus. So everything that he does in us, he works in us to that end, that the end result would, we would adequately, uh, adequately represent Jesus well. Now look at verse 28. This is a verse that is quoted uh, very often out of this chapter. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Look at it again. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I'm not a cook. My job is to buy cookbooks. <laughs> because I married a cook. That's my job to inspire her. <laughs> and th thankfully, she's easily inspired. I did a fast some years ago, maybe heard me confess my sins. I did a, a long fast, and during that fast, I bought 29 cookbooks. Over, <laughs> I, I even bought a deep fryer, and we don't eat fried foods, but I was dreaming of sweet potato fries. <laughs> Figured that's the will of God for my life. So I bought a deep fryer. And I love Amazon.com, the one-click thing, you know? You buy a book on there, and with just one click, boom, it's mine, it's in the mail. And then it says, those who bought that cookbook also bought these. <laughs> and I look at them and I think, and I see why. Click, that one's mine too, and click, that one's mine. So I'm, I'm not a cook. I suppose I could, my wife is encouraging me to learn with her so we could cook together. So who knows, it could happen. <clears throat> but let's just say we were going to make some cookies today. You need some sort of flour. You need butter, or it's, or it's just a cracker. If there's no butter, it's, I don't know, it's something else. It's not a cookie. <laughs> butter, you need some sort of sugar. I like coconut sugar. It's, it's, it's healthier, and I, I like the flavor. So we got butter, we got flour, we got sugar. I don't know, you may want oatmeal. I like oatmeal. Chocolate chips. Yeah, no, no raisins, no raisins. Can't make it as a grape. We don't want you in our cookie. Yes. So, I'm sorry if you like raisins, but I just would rather avoid them. It's, uh, I like them in their pre-spoiled form, a raisin, uh, a grape, a grape, anyway. And then maybe you add some vanilla extract. You ever taste vanilla extract? Nasty. Nasty, nasty. But somehow that nasty thing enhances this entire recipe. And most everyone in this room has some nasty ingredient in your life that when it gets worked into the entire recipe that testifies of God's grace, suddenly that which you didn't like takes on meaning. It illustrates the redemptive work of Christ. It models, illustrates grace. And a lot of the things that we would remove while he didn't cause, he has decided, I'm going to demonstrate all things work together for good. I'm going to use every part of the recipe, and the end result will be, you'll be like Jesus. That's his ambition, that's his vision for us. Verse 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? <laughs> I love that verse so much. I don't know why. I, I guess it's, it, how many of you know people can be against you? <laughs> Demons can be against you. The devil can be against you. He's not saying nobody can be against you because God is for you. He's just saying, if God is for you, no one else gets to vote. <laughs> no one else gets a say in the outcome. They can have their opinion, but the council is comprised of God. If God is for you, nobody can be against you that counts. Here's the verse that would probably do us well to prayerfully meditate on for about 20 years. Verse 32, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Look, look at it again. 
He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how she, shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Stunning verse, stunning verse. Uh, biblical meditation seems to be almost a lost art, at least in many circles. Um, Eastern meditation is you empty the mind. Biblical meditation is you fill the mind. It's completely different. Uh, Eastern meditation actually opens you up to a spirit world, realm, where you, you can easily come under the influence of an evil spirit. Biblical meditation is joining your mind with the mind of Christ and consider, actually probably the best illustration of meditation, biblical meditation, is a cow chewing its cud. It brings it up to chew over and over and over again. That's what meditation is, is you take a thought, a verse, and you review it, you pray over it, you think about it, you maybe quote it, you write it on paper, put it on the dashboard of your car. It's just something you review over and over again because you can tell there is something here for me and I don't want to glance over it quickly. I want to make sure that the full impact of this verse hits me. This is one of them. How can this father who freely gave us his son to suffer in ways that are unimaginable, how would he do something so extreme and not also include everything else that is short of that extreme? If he did this, do you think your car payment doesn't matter to him? Do you think it's possible for a father that is that good to go to this extreme to not care about what you care about? We make him this religious feature that cares about spiritual things and nothing else. And it's just not consistent with the testimony of Scripture. It's not consistent with the lifestyle, the model that Jesus himself gave for us. And so here's this statement, a statement that could stand by itself for eternity. How shall he who gave us his son to not only die a most gruesome death, but to carry upon his flesh the weight of every sin of every human being in all of time, the most gruesome death ever experienced because of that. How could there be anything that would come up in our life that wouldn't matter to him? Amen. This chapter is to endear us to the Spirit of God who models and illustrates this kind of father, who models and illustrates this kind of compassion, this kind of Deep, deep, deep concern. Jump down to verse, excuse me, verse 34. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Here's the interesting thing. Verse 26 and 7 says, the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us. 28 says, all things work together for good. 20, 34 says, Jesus makes intercession for us. I wonder why everything works out. <laughs> what does intercession mean? It means to stand in the shoes of another. It, it's, it, sometimes we pray for people, forgive me, but I've, I've seen this for years. People will pray for, in fact, I'm at the back door once, a lady that was visiting, met me at the back door and said, I want you to agree with me and to curse the city of San Francisco. I said, no, I said, I'm not going to be doing that. So she tried to cast a demon out of me. That was interesting. She said, come out of him, you foul spirit. I said, yeah, yeah, go. Just, just go. Sometimes we pray at a situation. Intercession stands in the shoes of and prays on behalf of as though it was our own issue. You pray for your neighbor. It's not just praying at them, but we pray as though their struggles are ours. And this is incredible. Jesus and the Holy Spirit both take, put on our shoes and pray for us 
as though our issues were theirs. And they're approaching the Father not because he has chosen evil and they're trying to talk him out of it. There's been that concept for years that couldn't be any more wrong. It's the Holy Spirit and Jesus that are coming before the Father because prayer is his assignment. It is his will. This is how the economy of heaven functions. There is a partnership and there are requests. And in this request, the partnership of God and man or the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is illustrated through perfect unity, perfect camaraderie. Yeah. And here they pray for you and for me and sandwiched in between the testimony of God praying for us is the covenant promise. It'll all, all work and it'll all work for good. Verse 37, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors. Say this with me, I'm more than a conqueror. I don't just win. I really, really win. <laughs> more than, what is more than a conqueror? I don't know. It's like victory on steroids. It's, it's like out there. I am more than a conqueror through him who, who loved us. Verse 38, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I remember early in my walk with the Lord, I remember finding this verse in the Gospel of John that I just, I put to memory for my sake, that where Jesus said, and no one can remove you from my Father's hand. Yeah. There's this picture of the Father it's in my hands. No one can remove you from my hands. And so here it describes all of creation, the good, the bad, the ugly. It says there's not one part of it that has the ability to create a wedge and to separate you from the love of God. That means that you and I live in continuous connection to the expression of, of God's love. It is good news. There's a strange connection. Those of you who like to study, which I would hope would be everybody, there's an unusual connection between Romans 8 and 1 Corinthians 2. Read them. They complement each other beautifully. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. There is this seamless connection between you and the heart of God and nothing can separate that. My problem is I can live aware of inferior things and lose the God-given sensitivities to his heart for me. It doesn't mean his love has changed. It just means I don't live conscious of it. You remember at the beginning I talked about heightened awareness? This, this is it. In 1 Corinthians 2, he talks about that, that you can't hear the promises, the richness of God's word. You can't hear through carnal means. You can only hear through the Spirit. So right now in this room, there are FM signals, AM signals, TV signals, shortwave. There's all these different things that are actually right in the room. If you have a receiver, you can pick them up. And it's the spirit of a man that becomes aware of God and his voice. Suddenly, I start hearing things that I didn't hear before, only because I had my dial turned to receiving from what God is saying and doing. But it doesn't mean it wasn't there before. Interestingly, in this passage, he says, at the end of verse 38, he says, neither things present nor things to come. And 1 Corinthians 3 is a description of our inheritance, and he mentions things present and things to come. What's missing? Things present, things to come. What's missing? The past. 
Why? Because he bought it. He bought it. It's not yours. Your past is not yours. The moment is yours. The future is yours. The past is not. It's not yours. And the issue, the issue of life is if we, if we revisit the events of our past apart, separate from our awareness of the blood of Jesus, then we actually visit something that no longer exists. We visit a lie. When you, when you empower a lie, you empower the liar. So twice, Paul says, things present, things to come. Things present, things to come. The past has been purchased. I have no legal access to it apart from the redemptive touch of Jesus. If there's an issue I haven't dealt with, he brings it up always with redemptive purpose, never to lead me into shame because the past under the blood of Jesus is no reason for shame. It is a reason for triumph and victory. It is a reason for celebration. If I could pray for something out of this uh, conversation today, it would be the heightened awareness of the presence of the Spirit of God and the redemptive work of Jesus that continues to set us free. Those two things stir up such a courage and such a vision for the impossible that there's, there's no more mediocrity. There is no more embracing the inferior. Suddenly, people become enraged in the right sense for the things that God has purposed to do in the earth. There's this, there's this thing that takes place in the heart of a believer that says, wait a minute, I was born for more than this. As I've said so many times through the years, Jesus didn't go through what he went through so we could do church. We, I, I love, I, I don't think the corporate gathering is emphasized enough. I think he has greater intent than what we realize. So I believe in it a lot. But it's to set us up to bring transformation, to bring the life of Christ, the presence of God into this environment around us. And this chapter right here, it starts off with just the pronouncement. There's no condemnation. And it ends with, the past is not yours. You own the moment, you own the future. Let's go for it. This partnership with the Spirit of God, this that the Holy Spirit and Jesus are praying for, I may pray inaccurately, but he adjusts my prayer so that it's perfect. I may have a wrong idea of what happened, but he corrects it. And in the relational journey, I get my values, my thoughts, my memory of my own history becomes recalibrated to what he says is true. There's always a chance when we have a crowd this size that there are people here who have never made that confession of faith in Jesus Christ. I just don't want to gather anymore without giving opportunity for people to come to know Jesus. It's the most important part of the day. And if there's anyone in the room that would just say, Bill, I don't want to leave the building till I know I've been forgiven, till I know what it is to be what the Bible calls born again. That's where the Spirit of God changes you from the inside because there's been a surrender to him. We're not trying Jesus. He doesn't come in trial sizes. He only comes as God but he's a perfect and wonderful father. And if there's anybody in the room that would just say, Bill, that's me. I don't want to leave till I know I'm at peace with God, till I've been forgiven. I want you to put a hand up just where you are. And I want to take just, just a moment for this. Make sure. I can, oh, right here. Yes, wonderful. Bless you. Bless you. Beautiful. Anyone else? Real quick. Yeah, I, I see this one here. Is there anyone else? Wave your hand at me if I missed you. All right, beautiful. Let's go ahead and stand. And this is what I'm going to ask to this gentleman, anybody else who, who uh, uh, I didn't see or, or have had a change of heart. What I want to ask you to do is right over here to my left, we have some trusted friends. Pl please don't move around just yet. Please hold on just a moment. Trusted friends that, that uh, I want to talk with you and pray for you.
So I'm going to ask this. I'd like for the ministry team to come to the front. And this gentleman here, if you would come right up here and come to my left. We've got a group of people that are ready to talk with you. Ministry team, come on down. Yeah, God bless you. God bless you. Go right, right over here. Yep. Thank you. Beautiful. Come on, somebody get happy. Give thanks for the Lord. Beautiful. All right, let's, let's have the ministry team, please. We need you up here quickly. I want to pray over you because I want to pray for this. Oh, goodness. I, I, I've never heard of an impartation of heightened awareness, but I'm going to go for it anyway. <laughs> How many of you have ever had like a skin condition where just the slightest touch you could, it just radiated pain and it was just, that's what I want, but in a good sense. <laughs> no pain, just gain. All right, let's pray. Father, I do ask for the, in the wonderful name of Jesus that you would give a gift of grace of heightened awareness of your heart, especially your presence, given to us as a gift. I pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.